we would like to begin this seminar by saying our land acknowledgement. Iowa State University aspires to be the best land grant university at creating a welcoming and inclusive environment where diverse individuals can succeed and thrive. As a land grant institution, we are committed to the caretaking of this land and would like to begin this event by acknowledging those who have previously taken care of the land on which we gather. Before this site became Iowa State University, it was the ancestral lands and territory of the Bakoje or Iowa Nation. The United States obtained this land from the Meskwaki and Sauk Nations in the Treaty of 1842. We wish to recognize our obligations to this land and to the people who took care of it, as well as to the 17,000 native people who live in Iowa today. I wanna to introduce Dr. Arbaco. Dr. J. Arbuckle is a professor of sociology at Iowa State University. His research and extension efforts focus on improving the environmental and social performance of agricultural systems. His primary areas of interest are drivers of farmer and agricultural stakeholder decision-making and actions related to soil and water quality, climate change adaptation and mitigation, he is also the, the director of the Iowa Farm and Rural Life Poll, an annual survey of farmers in Iowa. Well, thanks very much. It's great to be here. It's great to be presenting in person for the first time in more than two years. So thanks for being my audience and online. I see you. Um, anyway, can you see me okay? Am I centered on the screen, Laura? All right, great. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about like uh, uh, social science perspectives on farmers and soil health. Let's see. Here we go. So a couple goals for today's presentation. Um, number one, I'm going to be presenting some survey data on Iowa farmers' perspectives on soil health. <clears throat> I'm going to summarize some findings from recent reviews of social science research on adoption of soil health related practice adoption and non adoption and uh, then discuss some ways that agricultural stakeholders and folks who work with farmers and uh, related folks can help to facilitate more widespread adoption of soil health practices. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so why. Uh, research on farmer soil health perspectives. Well, you know, there's quite a bit of interest, of course, in uh, soil health in conservation circles, the farm press, private sector firms, land grant universities, uh, but there's really very little research out there about, you know, what do farmers think about soil health? Um, so the Iowa Farm and Rural Life Poll, which uh, was mentioned in the introduction, I'm the director of that. It's an annual survey of Iowa farmers and decided to put some, some questions in there several times over the last uh, five or seven, seven years. Uh, about soil health. So I worked with Ron Nichols, who used to be the communications director for the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, he was the one that developed the Unlock the Secrets of Soil campaign, which some of you might be familiar with, uh, an NRCS um, campaign that was, I guess it's still going on, but it was really in earnest probably, you know, four or five years ago. Uh, helped develop questions for the 2015 and 2017 Iowa Farm and Rural Life Poll Survey, and then I repeated some of those in 2021. So I'm going to share some results on there. <clears throat> uh, basically, the, the questions focused on knowledge of soil health, uh, perceived benefits of healthy soils and actions that farmers may be taking to improve, improve soil health, improve soil health. So I'm going to share that first before we get into kind of some of the more broader uh, perspectives on soil health adoption by farmers, soil health practice adoption by farmers. Okay, so big question, do farmers recognize the potential benefits of soil health? We're always talking about soil health is very beneficial. And, uh, you know, so the question would be, do farmers think so too? And so we put this question to farmers uh, on a five point scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And then there's an uncertain in the middle and uh, basically gave them several items and asked them to rate them their, their agreement. And as you can see, healthy soils can increase yields. 93% of farmers agreed with that. So, you know, we didn't know how many would and pretty much all of them did. And that's about as much agreement as you'll possibly get in a survey uh, when it comes to, to an item, or an attitudinal item or a knowledge item. Uh, healthy soils can increase drought resilience, 77% agreed with that statement. And then healthy soils can reduce input needs, 75% agreed with that statement. So some of these key benefits uh, that are espoused related to soil health, farmers definitely, in Iowa anyway, definitely 
perceive those. A few more um, kind of awareness questions they put in. These are the 2021 questions. Um, so I've noticed more discussion of soil health in the farm press in the last couple of years. Of course, there has been a lot of discussion of, of soil health in the press and in, you know, actually, you know, private sector uh, um, <clears throat> ag advisors are talking a lot about soil health and all across the board. And 82% 80, of farmers agreed with that and just 3% disagreed that they had not heard uh, more discussion of soil health. I've paid more attention to soil health in the last couple of years, 75% agreed with that. And then I've noticed more discussion of soil health among fellow farmers in the last couple of years. And that's a pretty important one, right? Because those you know farmers learn from each other, they talk to each other. Interestingly, just 50% of farmers uh, said that they had noticed more discussion of soil health among their fellow farmers. Um, then kind of knowledge and understanding. I have a good understanding of the concept of soil health. Now this, is, this is, has been a surprising one to me over the years because even you talk to soil scientists and they'll be like, mm, it's kind of a squishy term. I don't exactly understand it, but farmers seem to feel like they've got a good understanding of the concept. So 75% agreed with that statement. Um, wanting to learn more about how to improve soil health. Of course, you know, if you work in extension or actually if you're a teacher, you know, wanting to learn more is a critical predetermining of actually learning, right? And engaging with materials. So, you know, 68% agreed with that and very little disagreement. I would participate in programs that pay farmers to capture carbon through soil health practices. And that's a new one, right? Because we've just started to talk about carbon markets in earnest. Well, started again to talk about carbon markets in earnest in the last year or so. Uh, so I put that question in there just to, to see if farmers if were on board with that perspective or, or would be interested in programs that pay farmers to capture carbon. 53% said yes or agreed, just 10% disagreed. And then as you might anticipate, 37% uh, we're uncertain, and that makes sense, right? Because a lot of these programs are just in their beginning, and farmers are like, I'm not sure if I want to be part of that yet until I know more. Okay, so I mentioned that I'd also um, asked some of these questions over time, and so these are the same questions that I've asked in 2021, 2017, and 2015. Um, and so I won't go all the way, I've talked about all of these before. Um, but the, I think the main thing to take away from this is these have been relatively stable over the last six years, right? Uh, so there's some some variation in there. Some, you know, some 21, 2021 are a little bit higher than than 2015, and vice versa. But it's really staying about the same, which is interesting. You you might anticipate an increase over time just because there's been more and more discussion, but the, about the same. Okay, so in summary, um, you know, most farmers believe that healthy soils are good, right? They can have productivity benefits, they can reduce input needs and can lead to drought resilience. Um, most Iowa farmers have been hearing a lot about soil health um, and a lot are interested in programs to capture carbon through soil health practices. So um, those are the, kind of the main findings there. And then that awareness of soil health and interest in soil health is pretty stable over time. Okay, so that's kind of the first part, the kind of empirical study of farmers here in Iowa. And so now I'm gonna to go to the second component of this presentation, which is um, a review of a lot of the uh, social science that's focused on soil health practices. I mentioned at the outset of the presentation, there's not a lot of research specifically on farmer perspectives on soil health, but there's a lot of research on farmer perspectives on the, the kinds of practices that you know, farmers would need to use in order to increase soil health. So cover crops, no-till, extend rotation, and that sort of thing. So I'm going to, to, to lean on a couple of recent uh, reviews of the social science literature out there. One is from uh, Linda Prokopi, who's at Purdue University. She's a science, social scientist there. And colleagues, including myself, uh, did a review of 35 years of the adoption literature on, um, well, all soil and water conservation practices, but I'm really honing in on the, uh, the, the soil health related ones for this for this presentation. And then another one by, uh, by colleagues, Linda Perk will be one of them, but uh, Pernay Ranjan, Sarah Church, and Kristen Forrest, they reviewed the qualitative research on soil health or soil health practice adoption, or well, soil water conservation adoption. But I'm, again, I'm gonna hone in on the soil health questions. And just for those of you that are not um, really aware of social science research methods, quantitative research refers to like survey research where, where, where you're trying to quantify with numbers 
behaviors, attitudes, and that sort of thing, knowledge. And then qualitative research is based on in-depth interviews and focus groups, talking to people about their perspectives and capturing more nuanced, open-ended questions. So, so basically evaluating and, and, and reviewing and kind of summarizing the quantitative and qualitative research around soil health practices. Okay, I won't get too much into the detail on these practices, but basically we looked at all the US-based research that was out there, the social science research that was out there on soil and water um, conservation practice adoption and, um, and then reviewed both the quantitative and the qualitative. Um, and so, you know, these reviews, basically the, the, the objectives were to, to look at, you know, what are the most um, consistent predictors of soil and water conservation practice adoption. Just try to see, are there patterns in the literature? There's a lot out there. There hadn't been a lot of meta-analysis. Marshall is big on, on meta-analyses. So this is kind of a, a vote count meta-analysis that we did. And so um, what I've done is I've pulled key quotes from selected quantitative and qualitative studies to really exemplify some of the findings that we've, then the patterns that we found with the primary focus on cover crops, no-till and extended rotations and other soil health related practices. And the guiding practice question are, you know, what are the major barriers to and facilitators of practice adoption? Okay, so let's start off with negative predictors, um, barriers to adoption. So as you might anticipate, you know, farmers, anybody, we're all risk averse, right? We don't like to take risks, particularly, you know, with our livelihoods. Um, and so as you might anticipate, the one of the most consistent predictors of or barriers to soil health related practices are perceived risks. And there's a couple of quotes uh, focused on potential yield loss. I've never planted a cover crop. I can see some of the benefits of it, but when you get looking at the financial end of it, and then in the interim, who's paying for that for the producer and reduction in yields or whatever? And then another one, that's the only downfall I see in cover crops. It's gonna suck some moisture out. They say it don't, but it does something. And once you get that off in there and it turns out dry, you're hurting. So whether or not those quotes are really true or reflective of like real experience doesn't really matter. It's the perception, you know, those two farmers are like, that sounds risky to me. I'm not ready to do that. Um, there's other perceived risks associated with timing. Of course, we're, you know, talk about cover crops. We've all identified that when you need to put a cover crop on, if it's after harvest, it's not everybody that has that time. And that's time, you know, between all the other things you're doing on the farm, between harvest and the, you know, the onset of winter and snows and so forth. Here's another one. I've talked a lot to a lot of the cover crop guys. And if you're going to try it and do it after tillage, our growing season is so short that I don't know what around here is probably going to work. So now I've got to not only address cover crops, but then I also have to address my management because if I'm going to rip or do any fall tillage, then cover crops doesn't fit in that. And another one, if you're talking about cover crops, it's a timing thing. You get such small windows of time where you could do something that's a positive thing rather than a negative thing. I don't know how you throw that cover crops into the mix when you're trying to just take care of business. So you could see this, this pattern of perceived risks coming up. <clears throat> then another major barrier of adoption, which is no surprise to anybody in this room is cost. Uh, so, and this, this quote is really, Pretty amazing because it's from a, a natural resource conservation uh, service professional who actually works with farmers and his job is to sell cover crops or you know promote cover crops. So just take cover crops as one example. I work for NRCS. I see all the data. I've listened to all that stuff. But then I also look at, okay, it's $30 an acre. That's a big cost. I mean, in my budget right now, it's a big cost. And he was just starting out and renting all the land that he owned. So it was a big deal to him. And here's another one. It's getting cheaper now, but what does it cost to establish that cover crop? Well, I got a deal here. We can fly it on for $45 an acre. Well then, and what does it cost me to kill it? They've done the math before and without the incentives, the CSE pro CSP program, last year's EQIP, last year's state of Iowa incentive programs, it's hard to put the math to cover crop unless you could put a number, a dollar value on that nitrate saved. And I'll say a little bit more about that dollar value on nitrate saved in a little bit. Another major barrier to adoption is uh, lack of self-efficacy. And we, this term self-efficacy really just refers to confidence in one's capacity to do something, right? And so um, farmers' confidence in their ability to, to, to do something and also then the perceived effectiveness of the actual practice. So here's a couple of quotes that demonstrate that. 
Uh, and these are from quantitative studies. A second finding was that lower levels of perceived agronomic capacity to implement conservation practices was associated with a lower likelihood of cover crops adoption. In other words, farmers who tended to view nutrient loss reduction as a difficult challenge were less likely to use cover crops. So farmers that you know see corn and soybean uh, rotations as very leaky and difficult to, to control those leaks were less likely to, to use cover crops. And then another one, results also revealed that farmers were more likely to already use cover crops if they were more willing to take risks, had more education, greater response efficacy or their understanding of the capacity of the, the, the cover crop, for example, to, to capture um, <clears throat> nutrients. They had a higher sense of control over nutrient loss. Okay, so those are some of the key barriers of adoption kind of at the individual level. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what, what we call structural factors. Now, structural factors are really factors that are kind of outside of the, the control, the kind of the, the individual level con of control of a person. Um, so like markets, uh, policies, things of that nature. Um, and so there's one, one of the major structural factors is lack of infrastructure. So um, for example, like if a, a farmer goes down to their local ag retailer to, you know, say, I want to, I want to do cover crops and uh, it's getting better. Right. But for a long time, they're your local ag retailers are not necessarily set up to do, do cover crops. Um, and here's a, a quote, um, from a paper, many Iowa farmers believe that if more facilitating infrastructure, educational, institutional, and technical were available to them, they would be more likely to use cover crops. Uh, rented land is huge. Um, you know, here in Iowa, more than 50% of the land is rented. And in the more fertile counties, like in the Des Moines Lobe, we're talking about 65 or 70% of the agricultural land is rented, uh, which means, you know, the farmers that are farming that land don't necessarily have the final decision making. Uh, uh, over that land. And also, you know, they may not have secure tenure. So, you know, we know that the benefits, you know, soil health builds up over time, right? And so if they don't have control of that land over a long period of time, they not, might not be interested in, in building up that soil health. So here's a couple of quotes. Short-term lease arrangement is the biggest barrier in my mind. If you're going to keep the land 10 years and you have the organic matter higher and less erosion, it was worth it. I'm convinced. I think year to year leases are a big barrier. Here's another one, right? I think that's where the biggest rub is going to be. If your landlord is in on this, and a lot of them, my mother, I rent some ground from her. The first three years I put cover crops, she says, well, you got some weeds on your own field. How'd you get weeds so bad? Nobody else's looks like that. And this is my own mother. This was really, that was a good focus group. Because he was, he was like, I can't even convince my own mother that they're not weeds, they're cover crops. So it's a big deal. Um, Perceived benefits of practice. Okay, so now we're into the, those are the barriers, kind of the, the negative predictors. Now we're into kind of the perceived or the, the positive predictors or the facilitators of adoption. Um, so a big one are perceived benefits. You know, we talk about the risks and then there's also the, the benefits. And this is what we talk about a lot, right? We talk about the benefits of cover crops. We talk about the benefits of extended rotations and farmers recognize that. Um, and so this is a, from a couple of different studies. Uh, one, this is a quantitative study uh, farmers with higher scores on the perceived benefit scale were more likely to have planted cover crops. Conversely, farmers with higher scores on the perceived risk scale were less likely to have planted cover crops. And here's another one. Uh, I think the cover crops really served as the kicker to get me thinking different about really farming in general and to start thinking about something other than yield. If your soil medium is gone, there's no point in farming. Even if you're, I mean, maybe you're giving up five bushels one year, but you could be giving up your entire way of living in short order. 40 years maybe. And so that's like a really powerful statement, I think, of you know, a farmer really recognize the recognizing the short end, but especially long-term benefits of cover crops as a soil building practice. <clears throat> Another really important one is compatibility with the kinds of farming systems that that folks have. And this is a consistent finding. Um, there's a you know example quote, cover crops compatibility with the producer's current farming system was important for every producer who had adopted it. They were using annual ryegrass specifically because they were practicing no-till. Annual ryegrass was seen as beneficial for no-till. And another one, our findings show that conservation practices should be compatible or perceived to be compatible with farmers' farm management needs, especially infield practices, e.g. cover crops that would change farmers' current management strategies. So basically, you know, the soil health practices have to fit in in some way in, 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 the, uh, in the, the system that, that farmers have. 
Okay, now this is a fairly recent finding, but I think a fairly powerful one is the, the role of systems thinking and capacity to think in terms of systems. Um, here's a quote from a paper from a colleague of mine, Sarah Church. Our results indicate that farmers who had implemented cover crops were thinking about their farms as an interconnected system. These results reflect what has emerged in other research. Conservation adopters have a systems thinking approach to farm management and decision making. Here's another one. I look at it as a system. You've got to do the whole system. You can't nitpick. You've got to manage your nitrogen. You've got to get good soil seed contact because you're planting into a mass of roots sometimes. And you need to do everything. Just do one piece. One piece, it doesn't work. They get discouraged and they say it's no good and they're not going to do it anymore. You need to do everything. So I think these two quotes, one of them, the first one kind of represents, you know, the, the benefits of system thinking. But then the other part is like, well, that it's hard to think in terms of systems, right? Because there's a lot going on. And this farmer was saying, if but if you don't think in terms of systems, you might fail and then you know you're not going to do it for the long term. But I think that definitely has implications for outreach, which I'm going to say some more about that. <clears throat> and um, so then the flip side of the rented land conversation or the rented land uh, slide that I had earlier on is the support of landlords. And so there's been research that's found that if a farmer's landlord is supportive of soil health related practices, then the, the land the farmer is much more likely to, to do practices. So the presence of a supportive landowner <clears throat> or not renting also emerged as a significant factor. Those who consider their landowner supportive of cover crops or who don't rent land are more likely to have larger proportions of their land dedicated to the practice. And then another one, some landlords are supportive of their renters taking conservation oriented action on the land and very willing to provide support through action as extent actions such as extending the length of their operator's lease to facilitate implementation of conservation practices on their land. And so that's addressing kind of that longer term security, tenure security question there. Um, another really important <clears throat> factor, excuse me, uh, seeking and using information, especially from trusted entities. And, you know, this is associated with, you know, engaging with extension and going to field days and that sort of thing. So here's a quote. I tend to look towards university sources and research that you can tend to interpret them as being unbiased. You don't necessarily put much as much faith in commercially funded research that is promoting their products. And then trust or lack thereof in sources of information in general or in specific sources of information such as farmers, watershed groups, conservation agencies, and university extension emerged as an important theme that motivated or hindered adoption of conservation practices. So this is something that really came out of both the quantitative studies that we evaluated and the qualitative studies is that, you know, farmers that tend to like spend a lot of time trying to gather information, particularly from multiple sources and trusted sources of information like extension tend to do more practices. Of course, that represents a challenge because most farmers actually don't do that. I'll say some more about that. <clears throat> Another really important predictor is um, positive predictor is diversified systems. So we see again and again, farmers that have diversified systems, especially crop and livestock systems that have livestock are, are really important. So farmers with more diverse cropping systems were substantially more likely to have planted cover crops. Likewise, farmers who reported having livestock more likely to have adopted cover crops. And so it just seems that those kind of practices, extended rotations, like with the small grain or alfalfa or cover crops really fit much better into those more integrated systems. <clears throat> okay, and of course, you know, awareness, attitudes and values, but particularly, you know, attitudes like, um, uh, you know, knowledge of a situation, concern about a situation. If you don't know, uh, you know, that you've got soil health problems, or if you don't know that you have disease problems, you're probably not even going to be concerned. You're not going to do anything about it. So really awareness of a problem is first or awareness of potential solution comes first, then some sort of concern about a problem and then action, right? So, so a really important um, predictor is awareness and concern about soil and water health issues. So uh, here's just a couple of quotes. You're trying to think ahead and say, how can I make that soil more resilient or able to handle the stresses, whether it's a dry stress or too much rain or something like that, you know, by having that structure and those roots there from cover crops and holding onto that soil, maybe hold on to more nutrients through the winter. So that kind of concern about nutrient loss being a driver. 
And then uh, another one, building tilth in the soil, that's gonna be the main thing that a farmer is gonna say, or where's the payback on this? How can I make that soil more resilient or able to handle the stresses? By having that structure and those roots there, holding onto the soil and maybe hold on to more nutrients. If we can keep those loose nutrients out of our water and use them to build organic matter, that'll be a plus. And so that's kind of awareness of the capacity of these practices to capture nutrients and reduce nutrient loss, but at the same time, deal with uh, the stresses of, of extreme weather that we're, we're experiencing more and more of. So it's kind of a dual thing there that are you know, strong positive predictors. And that really came out of, of both the qualitative and the quantitative literature, like farmers who are aware of the issues and is particularly those who are concerned are much more likely to adopt. Um, and then there's an, a lot of other factors that have been measured, um, attitudes toward programs and practices. That's another pr pretty consistent facilitator. So, you know, if a farmer has a positive feeling about like the, the conservation security program, CSP program, or the environmental quality incentive program, if they have those positive feelings about it, they're more likely to be engaging in those programs over a long period of time. Of course, if they're participating in prog programs that help to, to subsidize um, practice use, it's likely that they're going to be uh, adopting practices at a higher rate. Um, use of complementary practices, I think some of you might have heard of like no-till as a gateway to other soil health practices, and that indeed is, you know, that that is a thing. Um, so it's something that, that you know, once once you've got no-till in place, there's other sorts of practices that can, that can fit in with that. Uh, stewardship identity and ethics. It's interesting, you know, we've known, we've talked about stewardship ethics for a really long time, but it's only recently, fairly recently, that the social science literature has tried to, to measure that and measure the relationships between stewardship ethics and actual behaviors. And, uh, you know, what we found is that, indeed, there's a pretty strong relationship between stewardship ethics and behaviors. Of course, you've got to measure it and test the hypotheses in order to to, to, to establish those relationships, but yeah, they're there. And then farm size and income is pretty important. So uh, larger scale operations tend to be more likely to use uh, cover crops, for example, and uh, but farm size and income tend to be uh, related to um, practice use, soil health practice use. How am I doing on time, Marshall? Good, okay, got a few more slides yet. <clears throat> okay, so, I've thrown a lot at you. I'm sorry, it's a it's fire hose, but there's a lot of research out there and I wanted to summarize it for you. Uh, this section, I wanna talk a little bit about the implications of what we've gone over so far for outreach. Um, you know, McGuire Langer University, of course, a lot of us in this room do extension and outreach um, and in the, the Zoom room as well. So I wanna just talk a little bit about what I think, you know, some of these findings, the implications for um, doing outreach. And so, you know, we started out talking about risk, right? And perceived risk, and that is a really big barrier. I think that's that's huge. And a lot of times as extension folks and, and people that, that are really into cover crops and soil health practices, we talk an awful lot about the benefits and the potential benefits that farmers can get. And farmers understand that, right? And they're like, yeah, the benefits, I understand that, but it's risky. And if I don't know how to manage the risk, I'm not gonna take the risk to get those benefits. So you, you have to, we always have to realize that yeah, we all do this, right? But farmers especially are always weighing the, the, the costs, the potential costs and benefits. So, um, you know, so it can be a really major discouragement. So here's just, here's a quote. So you're talking about yield. So if you, and this is a really important problem. So if you lose one year, you have one year down and that's not just a one year prop problem. They're talking about crop insurance. Let's say it's only 10 bushels, but you dropped out your 10 year average down to down one bushel. So that would be an issue for me because you're doing the cover crop as a risk. So now you're not just not only getting a risk of investing in the cover crops, cover crop, now you're also using your yield. So that's not just a one year problem, that's a 10 year problem. So cover crops are, I mean, uh, crop insurance is linked to like 10 year averages, uh, what they call actual production history, APH. And so if you take yield hit, it's, I think it's an Olympic average. So there's, there's years that are dropped. But if you take yield hits consistently, you're gonna drop your, your yield a, APH and that's gonna drop your potential crop insurance uh, payout, which is a big deal considering that farmers these days, about 20% of their net income comes from crop insurance revenue, uh, you know, revenue insurance, revenue guarantee insurance. So, but the bottom line is risk management is really important. And so working with farmers to help them understand how to, to navigate those risks. <clears throat> um, so number two, farmers prefer incremental change. I mean, none of us likes change. I heard a, somebody, 
I was at a presentation the other day and somebody said the only the only beings that like change or the only humans that like change are wet babies. And I thought that was a good one. You know, <laughs> babies with wet diapers, they like change, but everybody else, we don't like change. Um, but, you know, like everybody, farmers like incremental change, so small changes. And so, you know, we know this, but it's important to, to, to visit, to revisit this and stress it is that starting small and helping farmers experiment on small acreages until they understand what's going on and they can, they can, they can move it up to, to higher acreages. And this is one, uh, a quote that demonstrates what not to do. So I think you have to do it, adopt cover crops in moderation because we had a farmer that did all these corn acres in the following fall with ryegrass and he had a local fertilizer plant spread to kill it in the spring. But the day they wanted to do it and the day they had to do it was not the day he wanted it done. And that's where his mistake came and the weather changed and they couldn't get back to it. And when you put the planter in there, everything wrapped around the chain. And so that's why I say you have to do things in moderation. So this is a farmer that really wanted to go, go at it and do the whole thing but wasn't ready to actually do the management and it didn't work out well. Um, another important finding is that farmers tend to be interested in longer term flexible funding support. And so one of the, our, our cost shares for um, soil and water conservation practice assistance tend to be like one time or short term, like a couple of years. And a few of the farmers that we've talked to are think that that's just not enough to manage the risks and manage the costs and manage that kind of the, the scale up. So here's one, I think the cost share has to be available year after year. It can't just be, we'll start you out with 25 acres for one year and then you're on your own. Or a hassle associated with conservation adoption for a two-year program versus a hassle for, your ten, for a 10-year program. Okay, it's worth a hassle for a 10-year program, but a two years, maybe it's not worth the hassle. And the hassle is like the paperwork and the, you know, the, the, the monitoring and, and so forth. So I, I think you know the, the point of this is that I, we need to think more creatively about the kinds of conservation <clears throat> assistance programs that we have to maybe think about uh, longer term uh, financial assistance or other kind of technical assistance. Another key uh, finding and implication is that local demonstration is hugely important. And this is, this is important for, for us, our, the university-based stuff. So one of the comments I hear from farmers, is they don't trust test plots. It's not a big enough data sample. It's like, and they held up their finger like this, uh, probably is true for that little speck, but what about the whole farm? So having a bigger sample, and there's another one, it's got to be from a farmer in our area. It doesn't matter to me if it comes from Purdue or Illinois or somewhere else or anywhere, it's got to come from someone in this area on these soil types. What matters is the people in this area that have grown it on 80 acres and average that yield, then we'll go for it. That's critically important. I hear that a lot. And one of the things, you know, uh, we've been working with Marshall and I are on a, the sea change project. And one of the, one of the things we've tried to, to gain some traction on is this idea of like lighthouse farms, like, uh, you know, the, the university owns farms all across the state, right? I think 12,000 acres or 14,000 acres. And so our idea is like, let's take those farms and cut them down the middle and farm one half with soil health practices. The other half can just be conventional. And that way in every neck of the woods, there's a farm that's got, you know, the best management practices on it. And let's see over the long term how that shakes out and then farmers can see it. So, but the, the bottom line is like, people are skeptical and it goes back to the risk, um, but wanting to be able to see it in their neighborhood on soils that, that they, understand. Um, getting to that rented land question, I mean, we've got to figure out some way to improve outreach to non-operators. I mean, these quotes, um, you know, landowners would have to at least understand, same as the farmer, that there's value in conservation, same message that you got to convince me that the cover crop has value and affects my bottom line, that this has a value if you convince them that they're protecting their long-term invest investment, there's maybe even more of a value to them than even I have on a year-to-year -year lease, where I'm just struggling to make my tractor payment or combine or whatever. And then farm management, farm managers, they have to encourage it with the landowners and so forth. But the, I mean, the bottom line is we don't have really good outreach programs for non-operator landowners. Most of our outreach programs are focused on farmers and um, you know, any given farmer can have like two or three, they average three, land, three landlords and they can have up to 20. Um, and they're just trying to, you know, juggle paying the cash rent and, and get that done and juggle their, their landlord's needs. But there are no real programs that are actually targeting those landlords. So the landlords really, a lot of them don't really know what's, you know, what's what about farming. So we need more, more programs for them. 
Um, mentioned uh, structural barriers, of course, rented land is one of those structural barriers, but also market structures. And I think one of the critical things about farming is there's not a ton of profit in it. It's if, if it weren't subsidized through crop insurance, over the last 20 years or so, 20% of net farm income has come from government payments. So, you know, the economic, like, if you think about commodity production, corn and soybean production, you can't like say my yellow number two corn is better than farmer, you know, farmer John's yellow number two corn, right? You're price taker and price taker in a global market profits. If there's ever any profit in agriculture, pretty soon, like within a year or two, those profits get drained away. You know, prices for corn went up this year, right? A little bit. And what happened? Like invariably, I mean, they're blaming it on supply chain, but input supplies, input prices jumped like that. And that happens every time. I mean, if you pay attention to, to what happens in agriculture, whenever there's an increase in price, there's an increase in, in input prices, there's an increase in land rents. And so there's this, agri what we call the agricultural treadmill effect that really makes it hard on farmers to, to think past you know, one or two or three years in the future because they're just struggling to stay on the treadmill. So trying to figure out ways to kind of short circuit that treadmill or do something like diversification and changes in, in production system, which are very difficult, but can jump you off that treadmill. It's really important. So here's a couple, here's a, a finding actually from a paper that, that Marshall and I worked on. A critical finding is that the most significant perceived barriers to extended rotations are factors that cannot be addressed by individual farmers, but rather will require changes in policies and research priorities. Changes to such structures will require transformational actions. So, you know, the question is, how do you overcome those kind of short term economic pressures to, you know, the farmers face to make their profit margins? And so, of course, there's a lot of discussion nowadays about carbon and ecosystem services markets and payments, uh, new crops and markets that would allow extended rotations and more diverse systems. And I think the more diversity we have on the landscape, the less of that kind of treadmill effect there's, there's going to be. So how can we beef those kinds of um, initiatives up? Um, and then there's other important considerations. I mean, we need more research-based information on fertility, soil health, and yield impacts. Remember that, that quote earlier on about the farmers, like it's hard to put the math to it when you don't know how much that nutrient loss a reduction is worth, you know, year to year, because they're the farmers, yeah, I mean, am I saving $30 of nitrogen by putting on $30 of cover crops or not? So more, you know, more research on that, actual you know, biophysical research. Um, you know, we're doing this to diversify partners. I mean, getting everybody involved, watershed groups, municipalities, NGOs, commodity groups, ag retailers. I mean, in order to, it's a big problem. We need a lot of, a lot of hands on deck. <clears throat> and then increasingly, we're trying to look at um, what we call market segmentation. So there's different kinds of farmers. There's some farmers that are more kind of productivist in orientation. There's some that are more stewardship oriented. And so there could be possibilities to try to, you know, shift messaging or change messaging, depending on what types of farmers we're targeting. So well, it looks like I'm doing pretty good on time. Um, just a final note on soil health. I think, you know, I've been research, doing research on soil health perspectives among farmers for Oh, six, seven years now. And I think I can say with a lot of confidence that the concept of soil health really resonates pretty strongly with farmers. Um, and, you know, they, they get it. It's like something that, that, that somehow they can feel it. Um, and so I, you know, one of the things that I have kind of observed in my discussions with farmers is that soil health can be like an integrative concept. You know, we've talked about like those short-term pressures. I think, um, you know, soil health can kind of help farmers think holistically and like move toward a more systems thinking approach because in order to get really healthy soils you have to do a lot of different stuff right and in order to do a lot of this different stuff you have to kind of hone your your system thinking skills um and you know once getting there i think it can really help to bridge that short-term and long-term thinking because you know we talked about the agricultural treadmill that keeps people thinking really short term um farmers really see the benefits of soil health accruing to them and to their heirs, you know, the next generations of farmers that are coming after them. So it's something that, that really, you know, they can be like, okay, yeah, it's, it's not just, you know, typically we would talk about soil and water conservation practices being good for the environment. And farmers are like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I want to be good to the environment, but, you know, soil health is like good for the environment and, but it's first, it's good for them and their, their production systems. 
Um, and then finally, you know, the practices that lead to healthy soils like no-till, you know, they're understanding that it's good for them, but it's also good for um, society, right? On-farm and off-farm benefits, maintaining soil, maintaining sustainability of our food production system, which by the way, is kind of the basis of a functioning stable society, food security. If we don't have that, we're in trouble. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, in order to, to, to get healthy soils, we need to do all this stuff that also, you know, builds soil health, sequesters carbon, reduces, hopefully reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so yeah, I just want to acknowledge my, my the team that I worked with to do these work on these two studies. Um, they're all over the place, Illinois, Purdue, uh, Forest Service, Bates, USDA, and who's any there? It's too small. And oh yeah, the Walton Family Foundation helped with, uh, with a grant, two grants actually. All right, and there's a bunch of references that I, that I pulled from, it's in the, in the uh, presentation. So if anybody's wanting to dig into those references, they're on there. And with that, I'll say thanks. Thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and give my first in-person presentation in more than two years and uh, take some questions. I guess I can look at that, right? I'm not seeing any right now. I've got one while people are typing in the chat box or figuring out how to raise their hands. Um, for your poll, does it include landowners or is that just farmers? It's just farmers. Has there been any talk about having a landowner poll? There has. So um, the American Farmland Trust did a pretty widespread survey of non operator landowners. So there's farm operators and non-operator landowners. That's how we kind of separate them uh, or the terminology we use for them. Um, the thing about it, so the American Farmland Trust has some really cool data that's been coming out. They did a survey, I think it's two years ago uh, across 10 states, most of the, you know, the Corn Belt, I mean, the Corn Belt was covered, but then I think that it's Pacific Northwest and some Southern states. Um, one of the biggest challenges is finding them and getting them to respond. So you, you know, it's it's not so hard to find a farmer, particularly in a place like Iowa, because almost all Iowa farmers participate in federal programs. And so all you have to do is go to your local FSA, or used to be able to do that. And then there's also um, increasingly there's firms, the market research firms that you know, start with farm service agency data, and then they just maintain lists of active farmers. Um, the, the data is out there, and particularly because they're using, they're receiving public, public money is kind of the, the, the beginning thing. But landowners, on the other hand, are, in, you know, diffuse and increasingly diffuse, right? So as uh, landowners inherit land, it'll get split up between siblings, right? And so you might have 160 acres that get split up each generation. So then you have like these little pieces of land. So if you look at any given you know, township, because you, you can you can get the tax rolls and you can look at the township tax rolls. There's a ton of small portions of land. There might only be like six or seven farmers, but there's, you know, dozens of, of landowners. And so that's a big challenge. And so you look, but the, the challenge is you look at those tax rolls and you don't know which ones are farmers and which ones are landowners. So you can, you can survey landowners and then you'll get you know, some farmers and lots of landowners. And so there's challenges to do that. And in order to, to survey enough of them at a statewide level is, is a big challenge. That's probably more than you were looking for, but um, <clears throat> it's easier, to, it's easier to, to survey farmers. Um, it's easier to get a better response rate from farmers than it is for non operated landowners. And that's also the challenge of like the outreach to, the, to that group, right? It's in order to, contact them, like in order to contact farmers, you just go to your local USDA office and you can put a message in kind of, a, I mean, it's not that easy, but you can, you could you know, feasibly get a message in the, the, the USDA bulletins that go out or you know, your local extension person has lists of farmers can get that out. But non-operator landowners is not such an easy task. Any other questions? I don't see any questions in the chat. I, I had a question about some of your uh, quantitative data earlier in your talk. Yeah. It seemed, that, and maybe I'm not remembering this correctly, Jay, that there was a discrepancy between farmers hearing about and being interested in soil health 
But then when you asked them about their friends, their friends have heard, or they've heard their friends talking about it, it was much lower. Yeah. So, so, so it was basically their personal experience, whether they had heard more or read more about soil health themselves, or if their fellow farmers had, had heard about it. And that, it didn't, it doesn't really surprise me because oftentimes farmers are reticent to say something about like their colleagues because they, they might just not know. They probably just, I mean, there was a lot of uncertainty there. So they're probably like, I don't know what my fellow farmer, I think I, I'd have to go back to that. I, I'm pretty sure it's the question was, um, I've heard my fellow farmers talking about, no, it's, I've heard my fellow farmers talking about soil health. So no, I'm, I'm sorry, I kind of messed up on that one. So yeah, I mean, they maybe they're learning about it, they're hearing about it, but maybe they're not talking about it with their fellow farmers in the coffee shop. That's oh, probably that's what it is. So yeah, maybe that is a that is kind of a discrepancy. So that you know they're hearing about it, but they're not like it's not a big topic of conversation necessarily, at least among half the farmers. Well, that's perceived risk too, isn't it? Just maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Talking about the yeah. 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 <laughs> that, that could be. That could be. Okay, here I got a got a question. All right. Some so the question is some soil health benefits can ha can take considerable time to come around, e.g., soil organic carbon. Is that long time brought up by farmers? Can those on the treadmill think about such time scales for environmental benefits? Yeah, so that's I mean that's the that's a that's a huge question. Particularly that's where that rented land question comes in. You know, if they don't have the the security of you know having that land, so. I'll step back. So larger scale farmers, we have to also recognize that, you know, there's 86,000 farmers in the state of Iowa, right? But only about 15,000 of those farmers are like contributing a substantial amount of income to the household from farming. And those farmers are pretty large, right? So <clears> thousand <throat> acres and above. And they're renting more than two thirds of the land that they farm. So that that's a huge, that's a huge deal. And so I think, I mean, it's an, it's a, it's a question. It's a really important question is can they surmount those kind of the, the risks of investing in land and soil health and land that's not theirs. And I mean, there's a number, we've talked to a lot of farmers that in focus groups, they're like, you know, land turns over, right. And what am I, am I going to invest in soil health practices and, and build up that soil only to have my my landlord turned around and rented somebody else for, you know, $15 more an acre a couple of years down the line. So that's a huge, that's a huge barrier. And that's why I think, you know, that the, the, the rented land question is not talked about. I mean, it's talked about a lot, but it, it can't be overstated how, how important it is. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, but it's a critical one. It is, we're talking about long time scales and where, you know, the, the, the time that people have that, the rented land security is not necessarily more than three or four years. And that's one of the, you know, the proposals and one of the things that we talk about in this space is we've got to figure out ways to increase that, that soil, uh, I'm sorry, tenure security, have non-operator non landowners understand that it takes a long time to build soil health and that in order to have if they're not willing to pay for it themselves, which oftentimes they're not, if they're going to have their their renter pay for the soil health practices, then they've got to commit to having like a five or ten year lease, which they're not necessarily all that interested in doing sometimes. But that's I think what we've got to have more conversations about is, you know, how can we, how can we number one, get the non-operator landowner to understand that these are things that are going to increase the value of their land. They're, increase the productivity of their land over time. So then in turn, the value of their land. Um, and so that they're willing to invest or maybe sharing the investment, but still having some kind of changing in the in the, the tenure arrangement to, to incentivize the farmer at the same time. So yeah, it's a, it's a big, uh, it's a big question. Okay, uh oh, here's another one. Let's see Let's see if I can see this better. Oh, Catherine. Hey, Catherine. Some of your research with Lori Nowatsky has shown that farmers understand that there's a water quality problem at the state level, but not necessarily at their local level. Do you think there's a similar mindset with soil health? Like the soil health problems are over there, not on my farm. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, and it might be, yeah, 
I, I don't have the answer to that question. I mean, I think I have a feeling that farmers are probably overestimating their soil health a little bit, like overestimating their ability to understand soil health and how to manage for soil health. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's a good question. Stumped me, Catherine. <laughs> almost like the opposite of NIMBY. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a problem in my backyard. Any other questions? we got a few minutes left. It's, in some ways, it's a general question about, about polling, but there's always you know, the chance for blind sites. Not that you have to worry about your, your polls, but if you were to worry about any kind of uh, blind spots mm. uh, within uh, how polling goes what would you worry about yeah so i'm always worried about you know the value i mean the, the validity and reliability of surveys you know because there's there's a lot of things that you can worry about um one of the bias there's there's always different sources of bias one source of bias in there's a couple sources of bias in the iowa farm and rural life poll that are important to to think about uh, number one it's a panel survey so we're you're interviewing the same farmers year after year uh, we every year we lose a couple hundred because they retire or they die or you know things happen in fact it's the like that's the worst part about during the serve during the survey is getting calls from the spouse and saying you know my my wife or husband died and yeah, that's sad but so that's one so so really the, the the survey skews older than the general population of Iowa farmers so that that's one thing another thing is that i've asked over the years my my passion is soil and water conservation. So I ask a lot of questions about soil and water conservation. I ask questions about climate change. And I have a feeling that over time, the farmers that don't mind or like to answer questions about soil and water conservation or climate change are ones that are into soil and water conservation. So I believe that, that the sample is biased a little bit toward um, farmers that are more into soil and water conservation. So those are those are two issues. Um, there's there's all kinds of issues that can creep up. I mean, bad questions. I mean, I've never had a. I've been doing survey research now for like 20 years, and I'm I, I've never had a perfect survey. I always look at like I get the survey back and I'm like, why did I ask that question that way? It's double barreled. There's too many words. They probably couldn't. You know, maybe they misunderstood. Another pitfall is like, are they understanding the question the same way that I'm understanding the question that I'm posing to them? Um, yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of issues, and what I always say is that like quantitative, like survey research, is a really blunt instrument way of understanding perspectives. You can kind of get a a feel for the general form of it, but don't put too much stock in it because it is, after all, it's a it's a survey, and people can understand the question in different ways. They can tell you what you want to hear, uh, or what they think you want to hear. Uh, but that said. It's one of the. It's the only way that we can, you know, with our research resource limitations, that we can kind of answer questions like, do do farmers even know about soil health, or do they, what do they think about? It? Do they care? Are they worried about X, Y, and Z? Um, so, you know, it's got it's like everything else. It's got its strengths and limitations. Um, qualitative research is amazing, right? Because you sit down and it's you know it's super reliable because. I mean, people can lie to you, but generally you know when people are lying to you. But you sit down in front of people and ask them questions and they tell you what they're doing and their decision-making processes and all these things. So you can really get an in-depth, nuanced understanding of you know their decision-making processes, why they did things. Um, but it takes a long time, right? So, you, I mean, every person is, you know, it's, it takes an hour to set up the interview and then you have to travel to the interview and it takes another hour. And so the, the resource limitations on it, like in a perfect world, we would do qualitative research with every farmer in Iowa to figure out, you know, so we could generalize to everybody, but we don't have those kind of resources. So we have to do what we can. So that's probably way longer of, a, of an answer than <laughs> you wanted. But yeah, there's, there's limitations to, to everything. But I think, I mean, the main thing is that hopefully it can give us some general guideposts about you know where where farmers are on whatever issue so we're not shooting in the dark at least we know in a pretty good um kind of confidence that they're somewhere here so we can meet them there rather than you know assuming that they're here and meeting them here and they're actually over here so 
it's fun. People are people are not boring to study. People are the <laughs> and they say they say that the social sciences are the the soft sciences, and I always say. No way, man. It's the hardest science because yeah. we've got the, the most difficult subjects. <clears throat> Human subjects are wiggly. They just don't, they don't conform. <laughs> Any other questions? Let's see any more questions in the chat. Cool. Okay, let's thank him again. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun.